had a had a pretty good season, you know, and not a single team called me to be on their team or anything like that. No so like, well, if I haven't made it yet, like I'm not gonna make it. I I've definitely spent a couple of months struggling to sleep. You know, you're like every night you're like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? Like, is this over? He was. Uh, if I'm going to be honest with you, Yago, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, fair enough. He's like, so you need to convince me that I like I should sponsor you. Everybody thinks that Venduro is not in a great spot. But the good thing about that is that everybody is thinking about how to make it better. I started getting that really, really bad headache. Headache, um, like Like this pressure was like in my head and I could feel like my heartbeat through my through through that headache. I, I heard her say, like, I think he's got um, a brain aneurysm. We need to get him to the hospital immediately. Whoa. I was fighting for my life, you okay. know? Yago yeah, Gary, welcome to the Downtime Podcast, man. It's been a little while uh, making this happen. We've chatted about it a couple of times when I've seen your events, but good to finally get you on. How's things? It's good, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I guess we are. Uh, We've bumped into into each other a lot of times, and we I think we were trying to make it happen in person, eh? But like, it's it's complicated. <laughs> it's hard, yeah. Making sure we're Dude. both at events, and normally if you're at an event, then you're pretty hectic with riding, racing, practicing, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, maybe yeah. better doing it remote. And we've not not had you on the show before, so we'll get a bit of a full background on you. And uh, I did a bit of digging around, and um, there's a link to a, a pink bike in your very early riding history, apparently, a shop that you went to with your parents, I think maybe to fix a lawnmower um, and ended up getting obsessed with a, a bike that you saw there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I guess that was that was my first bike. Um, yeah, we were uh, the little apartment we had in the, in the mountains, uh, well, studio, more like a tiny thing. And uh, we went, yeah, we went to grab something from the hardware store that, in the town is like hardware store, bike shop, and like everything really. And they, they do anything, and they had a little bike. Um, just sat, I think, sat down on the on the on the shop floor with like the training wheels and everything. And while while we were waiting for them to get uh whatever they were looking for, I jumped in and started pedaling around. And by the time we were time to leave, uh, I was like, I wouldn't get off it. I was like, no, I'm not getting off. So. Uh, they just had to buy it and <laughs> and I basically rode the bike out of the shop straight up. That's cool. And, so you kn- yeah. you knew early on somewhere deep down that the bikes were going to be part of your life. And your dad rode a little yeah. bit, right? He used to sort of take you out a bit of cross country and, and out into the, the mountains a bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my dad and, and, and my mom, they've always been like really outdoorsy and um, to a very like chill level, you know, like they just loved being outside and uh, my dad, my dad's always been a mountaineer. He's always like done a lot of skiing and, um, paragliding and climbing and hiking and all of this stuff. Um, so for them, I think it was, uh, in the early days, it was easy to take me on bike rides. We're not going to go paragliding or <laughs> climb a gnarly rock face or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, mountain biking was our main family activity, you know, that we'll spend our weekends just going on a cool, take sea loops and you know pack a lunch and have a picnic somewhere and stuff like it was pretty cool yeah nice and was there a competitive element to your parents kind of use of the outdoors or were they purely like you say more on the chill side yeah no so surprisingly like my family is zero competitive like and my dad i think maybe entered like four or five races in his life mainly skiing Uh um and yeah biking was never a competitive aspect um we were always just like you just doing something outside you know um and f- for me it was uh it was kind of like an interesting transition like we it didn't even come from from me or from my parents like the fact of going racing it was uh suggested by some friends uh we were we we joined like a club from uh from one of the biggest bike shops in spain mm-hmm. called Bitimania, and uh they had like back then they had like a huge downhill team uh so they were going to all of the races around the country and stuff and and one day they mentioned, hey, like there is this bike race um, in a couple of weeks, and they have a, a kids specific category. Um, so you guys should go try it because like it's gonna be really fun. And I was like, wait, 
there is a sport that is only going downhill. <laughs> like I haven't heard about this, you know, it's obviously as a kid, you're not very strong. Like your least favorite part is obviously the climbing. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because back then, um, my dad and I had a Cannondale tandem. So like a, like a two, two person mountain bicycle. And, um, my mom will come with us in, in her own bike, obviously. And, uh, every time we got to the top of a climb, I would try to convince my mom to swap spots with me. <laughs> so I would take her bike down and she would go down and down them. <laughs> and, uh, that was like my favorite part. So yeah, when they told me that there was, that was a, <clears throat> that was a sport in itself, I was like, I want to try that. Oh yeah. So, so yeah, we went to, we went to that race and it was super, super fun for me. Uh, I got on the podium straight away. I, I think there was three kids and I got second or something like that. So awesome. It, it was like, it was a, was a it a Maxis Cup or something? It was quite a big race. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a Maxis International Cup race. So, um, in a ski resort in the north of Spain. Uh, back then when those races were epic, they were basically like the European series. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it was funny because I got there obviously knowing nothing about, sport or whatever i like so everybody heading up on the chairlift to go practice like oh right so I'll get my bike get on the chairlift get to the top start right now and it was i was on like a hardtail 24 inch <laughs> kit bike with like this much suspension like i don't know like it had a fork but it didn't really do much <laughs> v brakes and everything and i started going down and i crashed like five or six times i don't know it was it was so gnarly it was a proper like it could have been back there at world cup track i imagine Ooh. And, um, it got to the bottom and, uh, and my dad was like, how was it? I was like, oh, it was, it was sick. It was so good. Like, I want to go up again. <laughs> and, and then somebody comes like, well, you went to the, to the top of the mountain? And we're like, yeah. Like, no, no, no. The kids race right there. Like that little <laughs> hill. It was like a grassy hill where they just put like a couple of gates and it was like more like a 30 second track. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, I think my dad was super stoked that I was like so into like a sport because back then like it was just more like it was a family thing and I was more kind of getting dragged into the bike rides than me like being like hey come on guys let's go ride you know um and it was a it was a super cool atmosphere you know everybody was so friendly and we made so many friends just on the first weekend uh that from then on like basically every weekend for the rest of the year we were on a bike race it was sick that's cool and were you obviously like second place as a kid you're going to be pretty stoked with that but were you there because you were enjoying the competitive element or because you like the camaraderie and the ability to like take part in these events and have fun like what was it that kept you coming back i think it was a bit of everything obviously when you're good at something you enjoy doing it even more right so um for someone that had never uh, probably done like i don't know like uh like kids run like uh um run race and i had done like i don't know like just some silly things i hadn't been really tried competitive competition at all okay so i think uh trying competition in like a more serious way and like being good at it it was definitely a motivator but like i said like going downhill with vice was my favorite it was my favorite sport without me even knowing it was a sport <laughs> so um i think it was a yeah a bit of everything just it was really cool. Um, you know, you get to, it's not only like the riding and stuff, like for me, like being able to go to a different spot every weekend, it was sick. Like I've always really enjoyed traveling a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, my mother is a flight attendant. So she, she used to take me with her on like on, on her flights and, and trips and stuff. So I've always been like someone that's really used to traveling. So I, I think that aspect also really was really, really interesting to me. And, yeah, it was it make it fun, you know. Like there's, there was there wasn't a routine. The routine was that you were going to a different place every weekend. So that was that was really cool. That is cool, man. And you know, some races you hear like they get so stuck into it early on, they sort of sack off schooling and focus just on the racing. But you carried on with your schooling, right? What what was it that you studied? Was it sports science? Yeah, yeah. So um, my 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 dad, I I think he probably like knew that could be an option, you know, like you wanted to drop out of school or whatever. And always from day one, the number one rule to go to the race in the weekends, like uh, you cannot fail a single class. Okay. Um, so it was, it was, I mean, it's not that I was bad in school. I was, I was, I was a, a good student, like not, not outstanding, but like I've never had problems really. Like, um, 
So yeah, I kept, I kept all through school and high school. And then it obviously went through my mind that not going to university, because obviously the dream was to be a professional writer and like go and race World Cups, down to World Cups and stuff. Um, but my last year of high school, obviously my last year as a junior, like I did a couple World Cups. I went to World Champs. I got second on the European downhill champs and stuff. And I was like, I had a, I had a pretty good season, you know, and not a single team called me to be on their team or anything like that. No so like, well, if I haven't made it yet, like I'm not going to make it. So I better get studying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. And so. your studies like allowed you to travel a little bit as well, right? Which kind of worked for you. You obviously had that bug for travel. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the cool part about, um, when I got second, the European championships, there's, um, I got introduced into a program from the Spanish government that is like the elite athlete program. Okay. So it kind of, it's usually more about Olympic sports, but I think kind of because it was in mountain biking and like the fed, we had a federation that had Olympic sports, but not, um, I got introduced into these, into this program and basically they, it puts you in a category where like you can ask for scholarships, you can have help with your studies. I even got a, uh, it was called like a tutor, like someone that I could speak with from the Spanish government will work for the government mm -hmm. that if I needed to change any exam, so I needed something from, from a teacher, they would call the teacher and they will ask them, you know, to see if they, if they can make it happen. And, uh, lucky for me, I was studying sports science. So obviously, anything sports related, all the teachers would take it a little bit more serious than probably another class. And if they got called from like the Olympic Committee, I don't know how to, what exactly it was, but they're all like they always like helped me and they allowed me to to change that. And yeah, like I said, I always loved traveling. So one thing I had clear is like, okay, I'm going to study, but I'm going to try to have the best time possible, you know and so from the from the first day I was in university, my plan was to apply to all of the all of the exchange programs that I could to go all, to live in other countries. Uh -huh. um, so you have to do at least three years in your first school in Spain to be able to start moving countries and stuff. So I did the first three years, and then I applied for a scholarship to go to America to study there for a year. Um, so I I got that. And I went to the Northern Kentucky University uh, near Cincinnati. And uh, while I was there, I applied for another scholarship to go to Germany in uh, with Erasmus. And I also got that one. So that went straight from America to Germany. And uh, yeah, it was it was really cool. And actually, like, I think that's one of the main things that helped me reach the point in my career where I started to be a professional writer surprisingly for me interesting uh by being in america you know i like i was just using every every penny that i had to go race for fun like not not looking to become professional or anything like that i was just like well i'm in america i want to enjoy this i want to travel i want to write uh ride around here and and check out how how races are over here and allow me to travel um i decided to go to sea otter um, cause I've always, you know, always grown up seeing on the magazines and on the internet and stuff. I was like, Oh, that'd be so cool. And I got to meet, meet a lot of people over there from, from companies and stuff. And I spoke with them and I had printed my own little like personal CVs with some photos and some results and stuff. And I was handing them out to them, like really just, uh, looking for some product support. Um, like just, yeah, just so I can, didn't have to spend so much money on, on my racing. And I got to meet a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, the main marketing people from those brands that they were like, they were really, really interested in what I was doing. Cool. Like, I think maybe they haven't had that many people from, from Spain, definitely not from Spain and maybe not from Europe, just come out to, to there and, you know, and like speak to them and stuff. So, um, I got to meet a lot of uh, brands that I'm still working from, uh, I'm still working with right now. Uh, it was really cool. Like people from Camelback and Cram Brothers. Um, they like, they, after I spoke with them, they were like, of, of course, whatever you need. And then from there to start building out the relationship. And yeah, that would have been, I think that would have been like 2013. No, or no earlier. That would have been like 2012 or something like that. So yeah. Um, that's amazing. More than 10 years. Yeah. With those companies. Um, what do you think they yeah. like, what do you think they saw in you when you had those conversations? Do you think it was the fact that you were making the effort to be, there doing that stuff and you were just like so excited to be there and racing do you think it was 
like you've obviously always been a stylish rider like you, you know you photograph and film really well which is great from a brand perspective like i guess you had some decent results behind you at that point but probably not like incredible like you weren't you know winning world cup downhills and stuff but like, yeah. what do you think it was that brands kind of connected with because it sounds like it was an instant like good yeah. start to relationships yeah um i think it's definitely a combination of everything um i mean back then i think people used to do more of this you know it was more uh, traditional to just every rider would go to a Eurobike show or sea otter or whatever and go trying to like meet sponsors and try and get sponsored in person while um i guess it's not so much nowadays where people just wait for people to come to them like i think the fact that you're out there like putting you know like spending your own money to get all the way there from spain um that you've put the effort into like creating your own presentation your cv speaking about them and obviously i had some uh back then i was doing a lot of maxi avalanche and mega avalanche events like i have i had been doing them since like they started allowing me because I was too young when I wanted to do them. Um, so I had good results in that. And uh, by then I had started taking some, like doing photo shoots with uh, with some photographer friends. So I had like some really good photos to, to show to people. And so yeah, obviously a, a combination of everything, you know, I think um, being uh, European and able to speak good English with those people, like, you know, communicating is very important. Yeah um and then uh yeah i think it's just uh i don't know i honestly don't know i'm not really sure i think yeah just trying to put putting the effort you know putting the effort of trying to get the attention from those companies and and um and you know being friendly having a, a good image and trying to be look look like a professional <laughs> even though what not um it definitely helped me in the long run yeah good on you man and um obviously it's like santa cruz is a kind of a big formative part of your career you spent a good chunk of time with them was that a, a connection that you made while you're out in the u.s as well yeah that was um that was interesting it was nothing i actually it didn't happen during sea otter but um back then i was uh, i was riding for trek bikes through the spanish distributor and they had been supporting me for like, I think it was like seven years or something. Um, but then they had some internal changes. The the main guy I had been dealing with for those the whole time swapped and then like the, the relationship got a little bit worse. And while I was in, in America, um, I had a friend, a family friend that told me, Hey, if you ever need anything, I have this, this guy I know, uh, from Santa Cruz bikes that he can help you if you need anything. And I was like, Oh, cool. That's, that's thanks. Thanks that. But like I'm riding for Trek, so I don't really need anything right now. And then <clears throat> a couple of months later, I was like, Oh, you know what? Um, <laughs> can I, can I speak with your friend Santa Cruz? Cause you know, like it, it's not going so well. Um, so I spoke with him and, and it was really funny because, um, uh, I got on a call and I was speaking and I was telling him like, Hey, yeah, like I'm looking for a bike and looking for some support because I want to keep doing some races and this and that. And, and the guy, his name was Mariano. Um, he was, uh, if I'm going to be honest with you, Yago, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, fair enough. He's like, so you need to convince me that I like, I should sponsor you. And I was like, Oh, look, well, I've done all of this and I'm planning on, doing some national world cups and some uh that was the year the enduro was starting so like i'm i'm gonna try this enduro world series stuff and and the guy was like okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna lend you a couple bikes you know he was like you, you can borrow them and then by the end of the season you can you'll have to hand them back i was like oh that's that's awesome yeah. you know like two santa cruz bikes for me to raise them that's sick um then san mariano he was um he had gone to the same high school as me. <laughs> no way. And and it, it was from Madrid, but he had moved. He was living in America, and he was the global sales manager for Santa Cruz. So um, pretty pretty big dog yeah. out there. And uh, yeah, he he had a pretty like blind faith, I would say. You know, like he relied on like like his friend, our mutual friend, that vouched for me and and trusted that I was going to be a a good a good investment. <laughs> And, uh, and then I got back from, from America and, um, went to do a couple of races and I went to Mega Avalanche and I had my best ever race on like, it was my, it was my second race in the Santa Cruz and I finished, I think it was 
eighth or ninth overall. And uh, I, basically, I was the first amateur racer. Everybody else was, were pro. And, um, uh, you know, it was 20, 2013. So the Enduro world was starting to to emerge. And uh, and the day after that, I got a call from, from Mariano. And he was like, hey, I've just had a meeting with uh, with Rob Ruscope and, and Will from marketing. And we were speaking about you. And um, if you're coming to Whistler, you want to do a stopover in Santa Cruz, like we'll, we're actually going to give you bikes for you. And you're like, you're part of the official factory program right now. And I was like, what? Nice. That's sick. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was awesome. Santa Cruz, like, you know, supported me as well, like pretty much from the beginning. And that was the start of, without even really like looking for it, that was the start of my pro career. That's amazing, man. And I think it was, um, a film shoot for the Nomad 3 launch that kind of brought you to a lot of people's attention. There was a classic shot from Gary Perkin of you throwing the horns <laughs> mid-drift. Um, and yeah. I think you weren't even supposed to be part of that shoot initially. Is that right? Wasn't it? I think Chris Johnston was like penciled in for it, but got injured and somehow you got the call. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was interesting. Once again, I think a lot of these things to me happened just being on the right place at the right time, you know, and like making, I think a lot of things that's helped me is like, hey, if you put your the effort and you, you put yourself in in good environments and the right places, like good things are gonna happen. Um, but like if you stay at home, obviously nothing is really like it's hard. People don't come looking for you. Um, so back then, once again, I paid for all my flights to go to Whistler to raise the EWS the year before because I just wanted to go to Whistler. I was like, hey, this is a great excuse. You know, I'm gonna go racing, but I'm going to Whistler. I'm gonna spend a couple of weeks there. And while I was there, I met the organizers from Andes Pacifico, um, the Chilean guys, uh, Matias and Eduardo. And they, yeah, they were like, hey, we're going to do this race, um, you know, with Santa Cruz, the main sponsor. And it's a, it's a new concept, you know, it's multiple day racing and it'll be sick. You should come. I was like, okay, I'll go. Yeah. And once again, I, uh, because my mother was a flight attendant, I could get really cheap flights if they were like direct flights from Spain. And to Chile, there's one. So actually, um, with my very little budget, I was able to make it to Chile. And I went and uh, took part in Land Specifico. And all of the Santa Cruz guys were there, like the wheel from marketing and um, a bunch of the product guys and stuff. And I got to meet, meet everyone else that, uh, that worked for Santa Cruz. And during that race, unfortunately, Chris Johnston from the Nomads got really, really bad injury. He broke his elbow. And they were like the day after the race, they were starting shooting for that new Nomad. And so then obviously we were, I was like sitting there and they were, they were all like, Oh, what are we going to do? Should we, should we fly someone else? Uh, are we going to do, cause I have this whole story about, you know, two people, um, in, in the video riding these bikes and they had everybody set up, everything set up. And I was just kind of there, like, just like, Hey, you know, like, I could stay a couple extra days if you need someone else and this. And like, eventually they were like, okay, well, we're going to go with Diago. It's like, he, he's pretty good. No, like, <laughs> you're like, none of them had really seen me riding that much. Um, but I think, uh, Gary Perkin obviously had been shooting the event before. So I think he, Gary got to see a little bit of me through the race stages and stuff. I think he, he like put a war for me. It was like, no, no, he, he looks good. He, he can do it. Um, so yeah, we, they they brought me in for that shoot and um spent some epic like i think it was like four or five days just shooting around santiago some really really dusty conditions um on the awesome on that awesome new bike and uh yeah it from there is i think that's when really it started peaking for me you know like I, it was um that photo that you mentioned the the one hand drift was everywhere i remember like kept getting uh, photos sent from friends like hey like there's a photo of you printed huge in whistler village and there's a photo of you in santa cruz and this and that i was like whoa that's insane that's so cool and uh yeah i think yeah like i said being at the right time at the right place at the right time like helped me massively yeah and not, and not being shy of putting yourself forward i guess like you're willing to maybe be a bit uncomfortable and just be like yeah i'll have a go <laughs> yeah yeah for sure you have to you have to be very sure of yourself hey eh? you want to throw your hat into that ring you know it's <laughs> <laughs> amazing what were you doing race-wise at that point were you like were you still dabbling in a bit of downhill and a bit of enduro like how did you end up following the the enduro path yeah so it was interesting because in 2013 i did 
two two Enduro World Series and uh, downhill World Cup. And I was like, I need to decide where I'm, what I'm gonna focus on, you know. And like, I was like, okay, I'll do a bit of both, and wherever I'm doing best, that's what I'll stick to. And I did basically exactly the same. <laughs> I think I was like 50th in the downhill World Cup, and I was like 60th in one EWS and 49th in another EWS or something like that. So I was like, oh god, what do I do now? <laughs> Um, so I, I asked, I honestly went to Santa Cruz like, Hey, like you guys, like, I, I don't really know what to focus on. Like, I don't know if you ha- guys have an interest in me doing some one thing or the other. And they were like, well, honestly, like we have the syndicate, so we're pretty good on downhill, but enduro, like would be cool to have you racing enduro. And I was like, okay, sweet. That's it. <laughs> Happy days. I, so, I yeah. guess it fits yeah, then, more like, with your like desire to travel and see new places as well. Like there's a bit more variety and a bit more reach around the globe or certainly there was then anyway with enduro yeah for sure like uh, that was the best decision you know the the early days of enduro was insane like we were going to like five or six different spots every year like different continents you know it was it was so good i like i have no regrets i love i love enduro and like that was like it was a huge discovery for me because obviously coming in from downhill I wasn't really used to being for so long out there in the mountains, you know, like I'll go for like an hour and a half training ride and that was it. And usually it was more like a cross country ride than anything else. Um, and then racing enduro, like it, it opened up like a whole new aspect of mountain biking to me. And I started getting into it a lot, you know, just going out there to tracks that as a downhill racer, I would have never ridden because there were, you can you could not shuttle them or they were past the hour and a half riding mark uh so it was it was really cool for me to just get to experience that new aspect and like and all of these new places and um yeah it was it was so cool you know it was the best yeah man how how has enduro changed then in the sort of i guess it's knocking on for 10 years that you've been involved with it like we seem to have seen a huge shift in what enduro is and and that's not been a straight line path either. It's kind of almost every year it's sort of changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, I mean, it's been really cool being a part of it from the beginning because, you know, like it, Enduro has had, has had to figure out what Enduro was really, right? So like in the early days, it was always like a two-day race. We even got a one or two three-day race races and um all over the world and different kinds of like oh we need 20 minute stages and then we went to like no we need shorter stages and this and that and like finding that balance i think um i mean honestly i don't i don't even know if enduro hasn't figured out it's himself yet you know <laughs> like it's it's still like it's still developing it's such a young sport like you just you look at it like it looks like it's been here for a while but it's only been 11 years really of like the high level enduro racing so it's been really cool seeing it how it's been changing and like i keep speaking with people and people saying like oh enduro is like it's a very low right now it's like enduro has been going through ups and downs like for the last 10 years like it I, i've heard this before i've heard this a couple of times already you know you know so i'm like i'm i'm pretty i'm i'm hopeful that you know it's gonna come back up you know we've we've had we have good times we have bad times and I think it's part of of the development of this sport and and how it's gonna um, how I don't know how it's gonna evolve into whatever it has to be. Yeah. It just it needs to go through this this aspect. I guess when we when when enduro like like right now everybody thinks that enduro is not in a great spot, but the good thing about that is that everybody is thinking about how to make it better. You know, I think like I can, I keep seeing everywhere from writers, from team managers, brands, um, filmers, photographers, everybody's like really like, you know, working hard into trying to figure out, Hey, okay, what do we need? What can we do to make it better? You know, instead of like when, when the sport is like going really well, like everybody's just like sitting on the back seat and just being like, okay, let's go. Where are we going? I'm, I'm coming, you know, but now is, uh, I think it's exciting. And I, I think good things are going to happen are going to come from this you know like obviously you you see a lot of a lot of people putting effort and and thinking um on ways of improving all all of the aspects really not not even only like the racing racing wise nice that's cool man it's really interesting to hear that positive perspective on it because there is a lot of kind of negative feelings and i completely understand that like looking from the outside last year it looked a little bit 
<clears throat> unloved and it definitely sort of lacked um exposure i guess which means brands struggle to justify return on investment and bringing money in like if it was yours what would you do with it like what what do you think would help improve the sport um you know both from a racing perspective but also from a sort of a fan perspective a coverage and accessibility perspective it's it's really it's really hard to tell i think at the beginning, it was like really exciting to be like, okay, so we're part of the World Cup circus now, and we're gonna be at the same places as all these people are. But you know, there's only so much attention from the public, right? Like, there's like there's ten thousand eyes, and if there's three places to look at, not everybody's gonna look at the same place, you yeah. know. And I think uh, we need a little bit more independence from the other from the other sports i think unfortunately um being surrounded by you know downhill or cross country um it takes a lot of the attention and like and we could all i remember all, like back in the days we there were some races that the ews was at the same time as the downhill races and you can no, notice a lot how much of that attention even though you were in different corners of the world was going somewhere else instead of enduro but the weekends of only an enduro world series was happening like all the eyes were on there like yeah. even people that maybe weren't so interested but like it was the only thing to, to look at so i think um that that would definitely help us a little bit more yeah. um i know for organizers maybe maybe it's easier to have all of this all downhill and enduro together but I, honestly i think it's probably a nightmare um because you know like downhill it's it's already like very, very challenging. And if you throw in enduro, which is like with resources, like it might even be more, you know, like there's many, more, more tracks to tape, to take care of, to marshal, to coordinate schedules, to from ambulances, everything, you know, like it's a, it's a, it's a wider operation. Um, so I think hopefully in the future, we're going to have a little bit more separation because, I think, you know, like having down in cross country is probably really good because they're kind of different spectators and, and it's not really, I guess cross country practice is not super, I don't know how many people go to watch cross country practice. So like, it's okay that down is happening at the same time as cross country practice and things like that, because it's not gonna, it's not gonna overlap, yeah. you know, and people are going to have to choose really, but whenever you're having enduro and downhill at the same time, it's, 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 it's probably difficult for, for the fans to, to choose where to go so that would be one of the first things i'll kind of try and do just get out get out a, a way from downhill and um yeah see where that gets us yeah no, I, th I i think that's totally right like it was a shame to see like in Leer gang it felt massively overshadowed by the cross country and the downhill like it, it felt like uh, yeah it was like third in the pecking order and it deserves more than that. And I think that happened on the websites, right? There's only a certain amount of web traffic. There's only a certain amount of photographers, videographers, and yeah. the, the, the hierarchy seems to be that they'll focus on cross country and downhill ahead of that because there's a live broadcast and all that. So yeah, I think yeah. separating it would be good. Um, has it been hard then to see like some of your fellow athletes and good friends without teams for this year? Because it does feel like it's been a pretty tough year and and this isn't just because of the challenges for the enduro side of racing i think it's just a reflection on the bike industry in general but it's definitely been tough for some people hey yeah i mean i think everybody could relate to this um I'm, i imagine everybody has seen their their jobs taken away from them or or having to find a new job and it is so stressful um for us really like we obviously have a passion and we this is what we want to do and we're really happy doing it but it's every year every two years you have to find or resign your job you know like you need to fight for your job every year every two years and it's so stressful and i i've, I've been really lucky really because I, I spent 10 years riding for the same brand so it was always like pretty straightforward you know but um uh a year ago when uh, Santa Cruz decided to close their Enduro team, I, I've definitely spent a couple of months struggling to sleep. You know, you're like every night you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, is this over? Do I need to start looking for jobs? You know, like I, I have, you know, like I haven't worked 
uh, I, even though I have I've studied and I have a, a university degree and stuff, like I haven't used any of those resources for so long. Like I don't know where to start. Um, and it's it's super stressful. And I think uh, I mean I know it's been really really hard for a lot of these people. It's it's cool seeing how some people have like you know changed their approach and like trying to like um, repackage themselves to 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 become something different and still be able to do what they what they like but um yeah i think it's it's more a, it's more a problem of the industry and how the money that is available than 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 like than those writers are not valuable sure. and it does that's, that's the wrong i think this is the wrong way, wrong way of looking at it i think in a year or two hopefully if this is the you know the industry is getting better um all those people will or even more people will will be able to get back to to their job and where they were before. So um, I just hope that, yeah, everybody's able to to keep doing what they're doing and uh, just maybe like we'll, we'll have a, a year or two of struggles, but then it all it all's going to get better. I hope so, man. So, yeah, how did the Cannondale thing come about for you? And, and are you like, are you a team manager role on that as well as a rider? How does that all work? Yeah, so I was super lucky. So, um, you know, uh, I was... Uh, on 2022 20, I was traveling doing all the all the enduro series with my with with Ella with my partner Ella and um uh when we we're in America I got to stay with her and and a bunch of the Cannondale people um just to to save some cost and and I get to meet them and and spend some days with them and uh by the end of the trip um Jonathan from Cannondale came to me and was like hey uh, I've been I've been looking at what you do, how you've been helping Ella and, and other people. And I think you'd be a great team manager. Um, we're looking for a team manager and, and a writer. And maybe you might be interested in this. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yeah. I'll be really interested. You know, it was, it was awesome being able to, you know, I've, we're traveling and training together, Ella and I, the whole time. But, you know, like to actually officially be able to do it and like, join resources and um and all the efforts into doing everything in a more efficient way uh it was really really cool and Cannondale has been a and you know always a an amazing brand and you know my first proper mountain bike I have I had half of a Cannondale from that tandem so like <laughs> I've always been I've known Cannondale I've been a fan and uh it was really exciting for me the opportunity and luckily um Cannondale was able to to make it happen you know and uh, we got a we got a deal and um I'm now the team manager and one of their writers for the Enduro, Enduro team. And uh, it's really cool to see how like a lot of brands, you know, are choosing to to cut on some brands. Are, it's not cool that they're choosing to cut. Sorry, it's cool how Cannondale has decided not to mm -hmm. cut on Enduro racing and like trying to like, you know, they're obviously like trying to save as much as they can, but they're still supporting the sport and they believe in the sport. And and um, it's it's been really, really rewarding working with them. Yeah, and you're back working with Will Ockleton, I guess, right? Because Will was marketing at Santa Cruz when you were there and is now, I think, looking after Cannondale. Yeah, yeah. So it was really cool. Will uh, started working for um, for Cannondale um, at the end of this, of last summer. And uh, yeah, it was uh, <laughs> like, a, like a reunion. <laughs> um, yeah, we were having dinner with him and, and Radboy was there too. And we were like, oh, look, we're, we're back together here. Like, <laughs> it's really cool. Um I think Will obviously was a huge part of, of my career. He was the one that chose to support me from the beginning uh, as a professional racer. And, um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in what he does. And I think uh, it's going to, together with him and Cannondale, is going to be able to even get bigger and better. Nice. Yeah, it was cool to see Josh back at uh, a little bit of E Enduro racing as well at the back end of last year. I think it was in Chateau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's uh, it's awesome to have him around. He's always like with uh, such high energy and so stoked about riding bikes, and like uh, he he loved it. He was having such a good time riding in Chatel. We actually he chose a great race because there were really really good tracks, and I think I think he got him really really keen on some more racing. So hopefully we'll see him in a couple more this year. That would be ace. Yeah, it's infectious watching that guy ride a bike and giggle his way down the track. So. Hopefully yeah, we get to see sure. a bit more of it. Um, let's talk a bit about your 2023 season, man, because it took a bit of a turn um, in Pietro Ligura. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience, because I, I guess it came completely out of nowhere. Yeah, it's um, 
it's pretty pretty crazy to me honestly um yeah it was uh i was racing uh i was in race day in pietra Ligure and uh i had done uh the first stage and um uh i was feeling i was feeling really good actually probably too good i got to the bottom feeling like oh that wasn't that hard you know like this was this this wasn't as physical as i thought it was gonna be and i looked around and everybody was like what do you Everybody was like, you know, on their handlebars, like breathing super hard. Like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, maybe I didn't try hard <laughs> enough. Uh, you know, I, I struggle. I am always like a, a build up for the day. I, I, it's hard for me to to attack from the get go. So I was going pedaling up, and I was like, oh my god, the second stage. I, I I cannot do this again. I need to go full on. You know, I have to I have to try hard. And so I, I started on that second stage, and I was like really really like pushing this time, and I was feeling it. I was like, you know. I'm usually a very, very conservative rider. Like I just don't really take many risks. Uh-huh. Cause like, I like sticking to my lines and like being safe and minimizing risk and stuff. But when I start getting a little bit loose and I get a little sketchy situation, getting away with it, it's like, okay, this has got to be faster because I'm actually risking a little bit, you know? So I was having a little couple of those moments. That I was like, okay, yes, this is good. Keep going, keep going. And, um, there was a tiny climb in the middle of the stage. And when I got to the top of that climb, suddenly my ears started buzzing. Um, really weird. Um, you know how like you're in an airplane and like kind of you want your ears to yeah. pop. Um, well that it was like that, but like times 10. And I was trying to like, I was trying to make them pop while I was riding down and trying like, okay, keep going. Cause you're in a good run. You need to keep going. You cannot let this distract you. And, uh, eventually like after, I don't know, like, 20, 30 seconds, they, they silently popped. And I was like, oh, perfect. Okay, now I can keep going. And immediately after that, I started getting that really, really bad headache. Headache, um, Like like this pressure was like in my head and I could feel like my heartbeat through my through, through that headache. So like it was coming like on and off constantly. And then it went back down to my neck to the point that it was so painful I couldn't even move my neck. But I was like, Oh, this is so weird. I must have like pinched the nerve or something, you know, like, like my neck is, I, I was like, this is so weird. I haven't crashed. I haven't done anything wrong. Like, so I was like, Oh, I cannot wait. Like I need to get to the bottom because I'm on a good run. So I like, I finished riding like the end of the States had like this super like steep, tight, uh, switchbacks. And I was just like with that, like a locked neck, just like, making it down like little by little trying not to stop i couldn't really i couldn't look around so i could only look forward and i got to the bottom i was like okay i'm gonna get to the bottom i'm gonna sit down for a minute i'm gonna relax and then i'm sure like it's gonna get better i can keep going to stage three um but unfortunately i i got to the bottom i i lay down and i couldn't move from there like the pain was so unbearable i couldn't even open my eyes and uh Everybody started like there was um Tom from the from the Enduro World Cup, uh, the social media guy was there and he started asking me. He's like, "Hey, you okay?" I was like, "Yeah, I think so." And he was like, "Did you crash?" I was like, "No." And he was like, "Oh," <laughs> like everybody was really confused. Like you didn't crash, but were you in the ground on the ground like that? And and I was like, "No, no, I just I just need to rest for a little bit and then I'll keep going." And and eventually like. I could I couldn't see anything, but I could hear all the riders coming by, you know. I and I could I knew when the when the woman had come by, and then the the other elite men came down, and I was like, oh, this I've been here for a while. I'm not gonna make it to the next stage. And eventually, Tom the, made a decision, and he called the he called the medics, and they came up, and they were also really confused. They were like, oh, he's in his head. I was like, no, um, no, I didn't crash. And so they were, they, they didn't really understand, but then the, the, the emergency doctor came and, uh, they, they got me in Australia, they got me into the four by four ambulance. And like in a couple of minutes, he was like, I, I heard her say, like, I think he's got, um, a brain aneurysm. We need to get him to the hospital immediately. Whoa. And I had no idea what that meant, <laughs> to be honest. No, I, I was like, oh, brain thing. That's not probably very good. <laughs> and I was in the, in, in a lot of pain like honestly like the worst headache you could ever imagine and um yeah i got to the hospital and once again i, I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time i think um turns out pietra ligure has a hospital with one of the best neuroscience 
uh, neurology surgery teams in in Italy. Wow. Um, so I got straight up taken to the best place I could I could have gone, and and immediately they you know they they start running tests on me, and that same afternoon they were they were doing surgery to try and fix my my aneurysm so an aneurysm is is where like a is it like a blood vessel or something that kind of expands in your brain what what actually is it yeah so how they explain it to me is like our our vessels are made of multiple layers right and they are they are like they stretch to adapt to different like pressures Mm -hmm. and blood flows that you need um sometimes uh it's really hard to tell why it is it they say most cases a genetic thing like you're just born with it um, some of those layers, either they're not there or, or they're weaker. Uh-huh. Um, so at some point, um, the blood, instead of going through your vessel, it starts pushing against the wall of the vessel and it creates a little balloon, uh-huh. uh, and starts collecting there. And obviously there's, there's no room for that. All that blood is not supposed to be there to so start. If it's in your brain, it starts building up the pressure. And the problem is that that could could then explode and then you would end up with a brain hemorrhage. Uh-huh. Um, so it's a, it's a simple thing, but deadly. Um, uh, they told me 25% of people don't make it through the first 24 hours of that. When, when um, did they tell you that? <laughs> <laughs> after everything, like I, I had no idea really what was going on with me until like 10 days after I was in so much pain the whole time. Mm. Like I could barely talk and everything that, I just, yeah, I was a bit of oblivious, which I think it was good. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if it's sometimes if it's good or not to know that you kind of fighting for your life. Um, but to me, it was just like, yeah, it was like every time I've been injured, you're like, okay, well, you get surgery, and then the next day you're better, right? Yeah. Um, well, I got surgery, and I wasn't feeling any better, and the next morning. They came and they're like, oh, you're going to surgery again. And I had no idea why. And it turns out the first surgery wasn't successful and the, my aneurysm actually popped. So I did get an hemorrhage. Uh, so then they had to come up with a different surgery where they actually had to like open up my head and close that little balloon thing from the outside. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty gnarly. Um, the, yeah, unfortunately, to my, I was like, okay, well, second surgery, like, I'm going to be good now. And I was still like, for another five or six days, which is the worst headache, like, I couldn't even sit up, yeah. because the, the pressure, you know, like, there was, even though they had, like, clean up most of the blood that had been on, around my brain and stuff, there were still, like, things that were not supposed to be in your head. So, even just sitting up was, like, the gravity just was making my headache so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't sit up. I couldn't even like, I could barely eat because I was like standing, like laying on the bed and it was, it was really difficult for sure. Like, um, I was in the intensive care for, I think it was like 10 or 12 days. Um, and it, it took a long time to start feeling better. Um, but then, uh, yeah, hopefully the, well, luckily the, the team there was amazing, you know, like they had the doctor that, uh, did the surgery was amazing. Uh, uh is apparently is a really well-respected, uh, Dr. Kageti in, from Italy and the, the whole, like all the nurses and all the doctors like were amazing. They were stopping by every day and checking on me. And I've, I definitely got, I think the best, the best care I could, I could have, uh, I could have had. And, uh, yeah, eventually, um, er, things started sorting out and I was able to finally like sit up and start eating more. And I think from there, like the recovery sped up a lot. And I was, I was connected to like three different machines that were pumping different medicines to me because it was, you know, like you, you're very delicate because obviously you have like kind of like an open vessel in your, in your body yeah. and like you could just, you could bleed out really easily. Um, but then once I, I got better and they could unplug me from all of those different medicines and stuff. I, I started to be able to, to stand up, you know, I could eat, I could get out, out of bed, go on little walks. And, and from there, like, then I was like <laughs> in a way better place. Um, it was, yeah, I was, I started just doing laps on the corridor of the, of the hospital and 
and the nurses and the doctors will come to me like, hey, you're going to you're going to wear off our floors. You know, you're walking so much. And I was like, I need to move. You know, I, I've been on a bed for, for 15 days. I need to move. And um, and yeah, it was uh, it was very difficult. Um, but luckily, I had a lot of support, you know, um, from all my family, friends and even like people I had never met before. You know, they were sending me all these really nice messages that um, that whenever I was reading them, like I, I could, I could feel the love and it, it's so nice, you know, like it definitely helps you with your, um, how you look at things, how you look at life. And, you know, if you say, I think if you stay in a positive mindset, it like recovery is always going to go so much better and yeah, forever grateful for, to all those people that, you know, took some time and, and yeah, send messages or called and yeah. That's cool, man. It's good. You had that support. What, what, um, what were they telling you that, that like 10, 11 days in intensive care, did you know whether you'd make a full recovery? Did you know if you'd be able to ride again? Like how much information did you have to like help you process and deal with that time? Yeah, it was, um, like I said, I could, the first couple of days, like they're kind of a blur. Like I was in so much pain that all I could do is like close my eyes and like, just hope to get sleep, mm. you know? Um, so I, I didn't really know much. I honestly thought it wasn't that bad. And it was only until I got out of hospital that Ella told me that I was fighting for my life, you know, okay. um, which it was pretty gnarly when I heard that. Um, uh, but yeah, like the, when I actually got to start speaking with, with like the doctors a little bit more, um, the the doctor the surgery was always like so confident she was like yeah no you're gonna find it she was like yeah you're gonna write of course you're gonna she's like not now <laughs> like every time like you're gonna have to take a couple months jill you know but like but you're gonna be okay i was like really like to me it was like really hard to believe because you know you were just like poking around my brain <laughs> like how is that how come i gonna get a full recovery but they were like always like like really confident that i was going to be okay um, and that was really good like obviously once again like it helps you i think a, a lot of the times the doctors are really conservative with what they tell yeah. you right like you always like usually they tell you worse things that you want to hear they're like oh no you're not going to be able to walk properly again and this and that you know like every and like every time usually you like defy what they say and then you actually recover and you're okay when this time the doctors were really, really confident. They're like, "Oh yeah, no, you're gonna be fine." That's amazing. Did Did um, you find it hard to be away from riding? Like, how long were you completely off of a bike for? So I spent twenty days in hospital, and and then another month and a half without riding. I think, and um, you know, to be honest, at first, like I was in such bad shape. Like it wasn't even like. I was like, I, I was thinking, I was more thinking, am I going to be able to ride again more than I want to ride again? Yeah. It was more the question if, like, you know, I was, I was really, that was the, the thing that was haunting me the most. I was like, okay, they're saying I'm going to be okay, but like, okay as a normal person or okay as a professional rider, you know, like, am I going to be able to come back to where I was like a month ago? Yeah. I'm going to be able to ride my bike fast and process things fast and react fast and all these things that you need to, you know, to be an elite, an elite athlete. And, um, that was the question I was constantly like on my mind. And I don't know, like I've obviously gone through those things, you know, when you break up, when you break a bone and you're away for a while and, and you just, you're thinking about it. And to me, the, the thing, it was like, I can totally visualize what I need to do. You know, if I was seeing a video or I was imagining myself in a situation, like I can perfectly visualize what I have to do, you know, to rail a corner, to jump, to do this, to do a whip, to, to like approach a rock garden, whatever. Like I can visualize, I can see myself doing it. So I was like, I must be able to do it. I don't know. That was, that was my, that was my thought process. And, um, uh, it was it was tricky, you know. Uh, it was really hard. Even though the doctor said I was gonna make a full recovery, they didn't really help me much with how that recovery is gonna look <laughs> like. Um, I kept asking, like, okay, so when can I ride? And they're like, not yet. And I was like, no, no, but like, give me give me a time, like in a month, two months. They're like, maybe one, maybe two months. I was like, oh. And then like I was like, and when I can I when I can ride, 
how hard can I ride? You know, can I start doing training? Can I start doing intervals? What can I do? And they're like, oh, I remember I went to a surgeon in a neurosurgeon in Spain and I was asking, asking him this question. He's like, he's like, I don't know. I'm not like a, a coach, you know, like don't <laughs> ask me what training to do. And it's like, okay, but I need to like, I need to get back, you know? And uh, so it was a little bit of, I had to figure out by myself, you know? And uh, it was, uh, it was a slow process. I, I obviously like the number one thing that everybody was telling me is like, you need to take it easy. You know, you need to give yourself a lot of time. Your body needs to heal. And um, even though they're all, everybody was sure that I was like, like the surgery was done and it's a really safe surgery. Like once the second one that I got done, they've, they've put actually kind of like a clip on my, on my, on the, on the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, that's there. Like, it's a very physical thing that is not going to fail. Okay. So they're like, so there's no, there's not really risk of, you know, having an hemorrhage again, but like, obviously your body needs a lot of time to heal, to reabsorb whatever was in your brain, like from the previous hemorrhage and all this stuff. So I just, yeah, like come up with a with a very very slow progressive plan to to get back into into riding and um, from I I obviously there were some setbacks when I uh, when I got out of hospital I flew the next day to Spain back home and, and I was like oh yes I'm free you know like I can walk I can do this so I get on my I put my headphones on and I was like I'm gonna go for a walk and I went for like I don't know it was like fifty minutes or one hour walk. I was feeling great, you know, I was, I was out there and uh, walking through the, through the woods and I got back home and I was like, oh, I'm tired. And the next day I woke up and I was so sore. Like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm sore from walking. <laughs> How is this even possible? And obviously like my body was just like, it's not as good as recovering back then because it has been laying flat for, for a month. So it took me two days to recover from my one, one hour walk. And I was like, Okay, I need to take it really slow. <laughs> I need to take it really, really slow. So I started building this this training program where like I would start with twenty minutes, twenty minutes walking, and the next day I was okay. I would do another extra five. I would do twenty five minutes, and then I do that for two days, and then I go another five minutes, and like really progressive, really um, tracking my blood pressure, tracking my heart rate. Um, how I was feeling and definitely resting a lot. So whenever I was home, I was like laying down or, 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 or sat down. And, um, after a month I was like, okay, I think I should be okay to, to start pedaling a little bit. So I, I, I jumped on the turbo trainer and, uh, I started again from scratch, like same idea, like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, like building little by little until, um, I got another appointment with a doctor and I asked him, I was like, Hey, like, what do you think? And he's like, okay, you can start riding, but you can't ride alone because there's like, it was in August and it was really, really hot. It's like the problem now is like, if you get really, really hot, like you might pass out or something. So it's important that you're always with someone. So, um, luckily Ella was willing to, to be my little <laughs> training buddy and, uh, more, more like my, my guardian. <laughs> and we started going on, once again, starting again from half an hour road ride, really chill, like on the on the easiest gear I had the whole time, and um, building from there. And eventually, we we decided to to get in our camper van and and go to the Pyrenees, trying to escape a little bit of the heat, and that way Ella could train a little bit better, you know, on, on some proper uh, enduro trails. And we drove past this um, this valley in Spain, uh, the Aran Valley where some friends had just built like a little jump park and we drove past the ones and there you could literally see it from the road. And I saw it's like, Oh, that's so cool. Like <laughs> I, I want to try that. Um, but then I was like, no, no, I need to take it easy. The doctor said I need to take it easy. So, um, we went somewhere else and then a couple, like a week or 10 days later, we pass again through there again. And, and we were, we went riding. I was on my gravel bike. Um, going with Ella up the climbs and then she was riding down the single track and I was coming back down the, the dirt roads. And the next day I, I just, I, I spoke with her and I was like, Hey, you know, I think, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to, to, to get on my mountain bike. And, um, I think I need to, I need to go see how, how I am on the mountain bike, like how, how are my skills? So 
I've come up with this idea. I was kind of trying to convince myself. I was like, there's no better place than the jump park because, like, we're right next to the car. So if anything happens, you know, like, I can get back into the car. It's really short. So, like, I can just walk up and it'll be a good way of getting into mountain biking the next step. Um, so we went there and, like, yeah, I was, like, trying to – having to really, like, control myself. Like, okay, take it really easy. Uh, walk as slowly as you can up the hill so you don't get your heart rate up. And then – if you're just jumping really chill, then your heart rate's not going to go up either. So like, it's going to be really good. And, uh, um, man, that was, that was so good. Cause I tried the first, had my first go on the jumps and I just felt like home, you know, I was, I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. It had been by then, it had been like two over two months without riding a bike, without riding a mountain bike. And it's funny because you're like, I've been in, injured but haven't really like you know my muscles were good my bones were good my brain was good like nothing was really hurt it was just i just had an emirate yeah. but like my body was working perfectly so it was almost an easier return to to mountain biking than when you've broken an elbow or you break on a leg or something and uh it was so good like that day i was like okay Okay, I can do it again. You know, like I'm, I'm gonna be able to ride the bike. Maybe I don't know if like a hundred percent, but definitely a ninety percent. Um, so from there, it was just, it was all, all good times. You know, every day, I, I had to, to be honest, I had to take like an, another week not riding mountain bikes because, uh, um, the next day I decided to do a little trail and I can feel, I didn't feel fast enough uh -huh. with my, with my abilities and. And it was re it was really hard for me to like read the track and and go fast. I was feeling really slow. <laughs> Ella was really enjoying it though because she was uh, riding in front of me and I was struggling to keep up with her. She was like, "Ha! Ah, now you know how it feels." And <laughs> it was it was cool. Um, so I took another week of just road riding, and then when I came back, it was just like like really discovering riding. You know, like it was um, I was likely. We were in the Pyrenees, then we went to Morsin for the for the World Cups, and um, I got to ride with my with our mechanic Carlos. And you know, like imagine, imagine it felt to me like I hadn't ridden for a year, and suddenly you're in a bike park doing laps with your friends. It was just like this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I can't believe it. And yeah, I I I decided, even though I could have like actually physically take part of of a race, you know, I could have raced uh, in Chatel. Um, I didn't think it was like the best option because I obviously when you're racing against the best in the world, if you're not a hundred percent, it's not really, it doesn't really, it's not really a point. So I decided to, instead of like, you know, get back into shape, um, enjoy, I felt like I had gone through enough struggles through that summer that I, I wanted to just, just enjoy life and enjoy riding. And it was, it was super refreshing. You know, I had so much fun. It was like the month of September was insane for me riding a lot um riding with friends and like watching it was the first time that i was in a on an on an ews world cup watching from the outside um so it was really cool it was refreshing to you know to witness that from from a different perspective yeah and you came i think you did you ride shakedown or ride some of shakedown i'm sure i saw a sven shot of you like yeah yeah so i i was i was i rode practice in ludenville and and chatel yeah. uh I, I rode with ella and um it was really cool because as well like ella had let alone the having to deal with, with what was happening to me. She he had had a concussion and she hadn't really, really written much at the start of the summer. And, but she, she put a lot of work in through, through that, through that break and being able to ride with her in practice. Usually she's more following me and I'm, we're working on lines and stuff, but like I had never actually watched her ride on a race scenario, like on practice and stuff. And I was following her. I was like, Oh my God. It's like, I was like, you're better than what I picture you. You are when you're riding behind me. You know, I was like mind blown. She was riding really, really well. Um, so it was super cool to just ride behind her uh, in a bunch of stages and um, just being there, helping her with lines. Um, uh, it definitely made me feel valuable, even not, even though I wasn't I wasn't racing. Um, so it was really cool to to be able to do that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and awesome to fight, like feel that fresh excitement for riding again after. A bit of an enforced yeah. break is super cool, and um, you got back to racing uh, li literally just this weekend gone, I think. And it was uh, you decided to go all in and have a little downhill race, eh? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was really cool. Um, 
Yeah, one second. I, I thought it's better to raise one three minute stage to begin that to do a whole day, a whole day of riding. And, um, you know, Ella, Ella wanted to do, do some downhill racing this year. And, um, I was kind of, I was keen too. So, uh, we have a couple of races early season here in Spain for downhill. And we decided to go down to Malaga, you know, good weather and, and good tracks. And, um, yeah, we went to race the first round of the Spanish Open. And, uh, it was, it was really cool, but it was one of the gnarliest tracks I've ever seen. Like, I, like looking back, I was like, oh, I don't know if it was such a good idea. Cause I was, I was scared. You know, we, we, we did track walk and the, there were all rocks. There was just rocks everywhere. Like I've never seen such a rough track in my life. And I was like, okay, I definitely don't want to get injured on my first race. I want to go, you know, I want to work, build up. So, um, took a very safe approach and my goal was finding the smoothest lines with the least amount of rocks <laughs> and didn't want to risk it much, but it was so much fun, man. Like, you know, the, the process of the racing downhill and like figuring out a track and seeing what works and what doesn't work and seeing how, when you figure out how to ride a section, it like gives you more speed for the next section. So then you need to look at this section differently and all of this, like it's this whole process is like, really really cool and i hadn't done it for so long like honestly like my last race i think it was my last proper download race it was at cranworth leger on 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 the year before they did the world cup there um now that being like seven or eight years ago so it was a, a really long time um so it was it was really cool i actually enjoyed it a lot so we're doing another race next weekend <laughs> nice um uh, just to, to, you know, build up and hopefully, luckily this track has way less rocks. It <laughs> should, be, should be a little bit less stressful. Um, but, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, just racing mountain bikes down the hill is nothing beats it. Pretty cool, man. And are you like physically like all good? You can push hard, you can get your heart rate up. Like, is everything like back to normal from that perspective? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I've been already like over a month doing like, you know, max efforts on the bike and training intervals and all these things. Um, that was my, one of my biggest concerns. Um, so I, I actually went to two doctors to check because <laughs> I went to the first doctor and the guy was like, Oh no, you, yeah, you, you gotta be fine. Like nothing's wrong. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> and he was like, do you know Lance Armstrong or Alberto Contador? Have you heard of yeah. those? I was like, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, they had very similar surgeries to you and look at them. They were back to normal. I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's good to know. You know, like, it's not just, not just, uh, um, any other guy, you know, they're like really high intensity athletes are going back to normal and doing what they want. So, um, definitely my, my coach was really, really worried to give me that, those, those training class with those maximum efforts. But, uh, you know, we've been once again, progressively building up. Um, I got a bunch of test downs, you know, uh, VO2 max tests and things like that to, to make sure that everything was working well and uh yeah it's all good so um just need to get back in shape <laughs> fair play man that is amazing to hear i'm stoked that you're uh back to full fitness and it's going to be exciting to see you back at the races um providing some entertainment for us all and there's always some incredible shots of you riding and styling it up through the tracks Thank you. um we should talk a bit about do you even drift bro or diet bro a business that you founded. I think the the name in the first place came off the back of that Gary Perkins shoot, right out in Chile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, back then, um, Gary, Gary, I don't really understand what it, where it comes from, but like Gary was into doing uh, hashtags about inspired by the "Do you even lift, bro?" Uh -huh. hashtag that was like that was the trendy thing back then. And uh, when we did that photo. That same day, Gary was so stuck on the photo. He downloaded it, he edited it, and like he put like put a hashtag "Do you even drift, bro?" on the photo and sent it to all of the Santa Cruz people. Like, look what we're doing down south, and uh, and and it kind of became kind of like my signature thing. You know, everybody was like, "Oh, do you even drift, bro?" You know, like do a drift photo and this and that. Um, so uh, forward a couple of years later, um, I got a, I had a friend that. Uh, was helping me with uh, some of my, like, you know, printing my jerseys and um, stuff like that. And he was like, hey, you know, like, I bought this this heat press to make T-shirts. And I was thinking we should start a, a clothing brand. Do you have any ideas? I was like, 
oh, you know, like I have this do you even drift bro thing that maybe it could be turned into a company, you know, into a brand. And uh, he's like, he liked the idea and we made like 20 t-shirts and most of them were bought by my friends. <laughs> and, uh, and then we were like, okay, well, we need to figure out ways of like um, promote our brand a little bit more. And back then he was, he was just making like clear, clear wraps for, for bikes, mm-hmm. just like for our bikes, for his bikes and, and my bikes and stuff. And, and I was like, oh, you know what? I was thinking it could be cool if we printed something on those things. Can we do that? And it was like, yeah, of course. I was like, why are we not doing it? He was like, I don't know. So I was like, oh, let's do like, I don't know, like some camo stuff and, and print it. And then I can give it out to friends and then maybe we can use it as promotion for our T-shirt company. And uh, <laughs> uh, we did that. I took them to some races and I gave it to people and people really liked it. And a lot of, uh, a lot of other pro riders like put them on their bikes and stuff. And back then we were only doing like top tubes. And uh, eventually we were like, well, actually, this is going better than the t-shirt thing. Maybe we should just start to doing frame protectors, and uh, and that's that's kind of how we we started the company, and it's been really 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 cool because we were able to build it progressively, uh, little by little, every year, doing more things and developing the product a little bit more and adding more designs, and and uh, right now it's like an actual company. You know, we we have uh, we have employees, and we're 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 creating something that. To me, super rewarding. You know, I, I travel around the world and I and I see something that I've come up with on random people's bikes, and uh, is it? I've, I'm really proud of that. You know, like it's really really cool to get to see that someone likes something enough that they're gonna buy it and they're actually gonna put it on their bike and you know they're gonna rock it and it's it's really cool. It's been really exciting. That is ace. What's your involvement with it these days? Like, how much time you spend on it? What sort of stuff are you are you doing? So luckily we have uh, our employee Vicente, which he runs the day to day, and he's you know like ordering product and shipping out things and the small things. But um, I've always been uh, more in charge of like um, how how was my self appointed title? It was a uh, creative director of marketing or something okay. like that. So um, yeah, I've always been uh, the one like choosing the designs and kind of like working. With the with the graphic designers and the artists on how the product was gonna look like and obviously testing it, always putting it on my bike, changing things, uh, and then yeah, marketing. Just hopefully, luckily, I have a lot of a lot of good friends that uh, are professional writers and they've been willing to to help me spread the word on the company. And uh, I've you know I know. Um, uh, I have a, a lot of contacts that has definitely helped me, you know, spread the word and I've been putting out marketing plans and things like that. So, um, but yeah, lately I've been uh, a little bit more involved on the, on the day to day, um, with my business partner, Mariano and, uh, and Vicente. And, you know, it's a, it's a difficult time in the industry right now, like everybody knows and we're noticing it, but luckily we're a small enough company that we can adapt to the times and, uh, we're we're putting together plans to try and like you know get get back to get back to a good level of of business and um yeah making more stuff that people are stoked about awesome and i guess it's like compared to buying a bike for example it's a much sort of cheaper uh thing so maybe not quite as impacted by some of the like cost of living crisis and all that side of things so maybe not as badly hit as some brands in the industry yeah, for sure. Like, um, we, like I said, we were able to adapt because we never have to make massive orders. You know, we're able to kind of like produce on demand and, um, our stock problem is not as bad. It's not as bad as having a thousand, uh, $12,000 bikes in stock than a thousand forty forty dollar uh, frame protectors in stock. So, um, we're able to adapt, but I think, uh, it's tricky because you would think like, okay, it's a product that's not so expensive. Maybe people are still going to buy it. But I think a lot of people actually start cutting on the small things earlier, you know, mm-hmm. like they're like, Hey, what is not absolutely necessary that we can, we can avoid spending money on that. So, um, we definitely, we definitely felt it. Um, I think, uh, obviously the start of the year is, is the hardest part for, for mountain bike companies because when when the weather is super grim i don't think a lot of people actually look at riding their bike or even spending money on the bike but uh i'm 
um, feeling positive. I think in the next couple couple of months, you know, things are going to start getting a little bit better and reactivate. And um, hopefully for the whole industry, it's going to, it's going to start getting progressively better. I hope so, man. Um, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. For everybody, it's going to, it's going to be easier if, uh, if the sun comes out and people are out on their bikes again and starting to, to spend yeah. a bit of money in the industry would be cool. So what's next for you, man? Like you've got, you've been through this huge, um, what, I don't know whether you call it an injury or what, but like a big moment in your life that has given you time to think and, you know, force you to step away from what you love for a bit. Like it, it I get the impression that the, the stoke for mountain bikes is still there. The excitement for racing is still there, but like, yeah, where do you see things going? What are you hoping to achieve this, this year or in the next few years? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of, a, I think it's kind of like a cliche for anyone that goes through like a life changing moment in their lives, but like you learn to appreciate life so much more. Um, and it's made me realize how much I love riding my bike. Um, and it's made me realize that I just, I really want to do it because you don't have to do anything wrong. And that could change like so fast. Like you never know, you never know what's coming. So I'm definitely looking at life in a different way and just trying to always like enjoy what I'm doing and, and don't really get too frustrated or too bothered by the, the sm small bumps on the road. Cause they're just small bumps on the road, you know, like you could, you could be in the hospital bed right now, but you're not. So like this little problem that you think is a huge problem, like don't let it bother you too much, you know, try and like work, work on fixing it, but don't let it like take sleep off from you. So I, it's changed my, my life in that way that, yeah, I just want to keep running my bike. Keep, I want to keep uh, being involved in the sport and uh, the plan is to race this year. And I'm definitely putting all the work that I, that I can and, uh, and I'm trying to, come back to where I was and uh, I think uh, we'll see what 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 happens uh, I'm I'm I feel I'm feeling good so I think it's going to be a good year um, but yeah all I know is I want to keep riding my bike every day that's awesome man do you feel do you feel like you're happier as a result of that like reflection that that moment's given you for sure I think looking back like you know the the past the the past couple of months since the injury are have been some of my my best months in life you know like I've I've actually genuinely enjoyed what I've been doing so much you know that um it it's it's really cool you know because I'm like okay well let's carry that on you know like always just be be happy with what you're doing and enjoy every moment and uh, and obviously like I'm not saying everything has been like you know great and like i haven't had any problems or any struggles but like definitely the good times have been so much better that i think uh if i can continue living like that it's 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 definitely it's definitely something that um everybody or like just try and like enjoy the good times even more good to hear. just take them in and and ride your bikes and share your time with friends and family and and stop to look at the mountains you know like even those little things um just appreciate them yeah because literally you don't know what tomorrow brings is going to bring and you might not be able to to be out there again yeah wise words mate wise words well we're getting towards the end of our time we've got our final four questions that we've uh, asked most people over the years so we're going to hit those up and the first one of those is if our listeners had um, 150 pounds, which is about 175 euros to improve their performance on a bike and they can't go and spend it on Diet Bro kits, <laughs> what would you recommend they go and spend it on? Uh, so I always listen to this question. I don't, I don't know when I listen to your podcast, what would I say? Uh, it's, it's tricky, you know, um, I think the one thing that has changed a lot in my riding, it's actually not a part or a component on my bike. It's been strong. Okay. Um, so I think if you could spend that money into a subscription to, to a training program or, or a gym membership, um, like honestly, it changes your riding so much. The stronger you are, the, the better you're riding, the longer you can ride for the, you know, like you can control your bike, I think. And we don't really, I, I guess it's changing, but 
when I started racing, like it wasn't the gym wasn't really like, well, oh, you're you're a biker, you just, you train, you go and ride your bike, you know, and you do more runs, so you'll get strong, but no, the, you'll never be able to get to the next level of strength if you're not actually working out in a gym. Yeah. And in a gym or like even at home, like, you know, everything's going to help you. If you've never been to a gym, you start doing some push-ups and you start doing some anything exercises to, to get stronger muscles and stuff like is going to affect your riding so much more. That is a great answer, man. I'm a hundred percent with you on that. I've yeah, massively noticed the changes in my ride, in my ability to like save moments that would have had me in the undergrowth before my ability yeah. to ride longer and harder and and enjoy it more so yeah fair play I like that one yeah. all right next one and maybe we've sort of covered this a little bit but i'd be interested to hear your thoughts if you could wind back the clock and sit down with yourself age 16 what advice would you give him uh well i think kind of related to this question i would tell myself to train more <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> yeah i was like i look back and like my my first years of of you know like junior like my junior racing days like where i was like training you know i had a training program i was going out and like doing intervals and stuff i look back at it now it's like that was nothing <laughs> it's like you could have done so much more and like like imagine if you were training as hard as you're training now like t 15 years ago you would have done so much better and like your races and like your bike riding and everything so I think, yeah, I would definitely tell, my, tell myself to train more and train harder. <laughs> Fair play. I like it. All right, third one. If you could have a coaching session from anybody past or present, who would it be and what would you want to learn from them? <sighs> that's, really, that's really tricky because um, so many people I look, look up to. Um, you can have a couple if it helps. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think... Uh, it's just always, I think I've heard this answer a lot of times, but Sam Hill is there, eh? Sam Hill is just unquestionable. He is, he is the man. And growing up in the, in the, in the era that I grew up where Sam was the absolute man, yeah. not that he's not right now, which he is, but just watching him ride corners like, like he does, it's just, it's a dream for sure. Like if, if he wants to share some of that uh, knowledge with me, you know, Sam, you know, what you reach me, we can, we can go for a fun writing session. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolute legend for sure. It'd be interesting to see where, where he ends up, what he ends up doing. Like he hasn't made a statement yet as to what the future yeah. holds for him, but obviously with, with no more nuke proof racing team. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to see where he goes. It'd be a shame if we don't see him like on a bike or at a racetrack or on video segments or whatever, but yeah, always a great rider yeah. to watch, man, for sure. All right. I hope I hope we get to see him on a race soon. I hope so. Fingers crossed. All right, last one, man. What do you do every day that you feel benefits you? Uh, I guess just being consistent with uh with uh riding. I think just um even not even it doesn't even have to be training just riding your bike if you can every day like it definitely helps you stay healthier you know i i sleep better if i don't ride my bike and i don't do anything i cannot sleep and then i'm like tired the next day and i'm grumpy or whatever so like i think it's it's just all a vicious cycle so if, if you're staying active doing something every day is it's it's important. It's really important to me, and I think it for everybody. Like, just it's gonna help your health and your happiness massively. Yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely, nice one, man. Well, it's been a real pleasure finally getting the chance to sit down and have a have a good old chat. I've really enjoyed it. I'm stoked to hear that you're fully recovered, and that you know, even through those dark days, it's given you some perspective that's helped you have a a happier and more fulfilled time which is ace um if people want to follow you throughout the season like where's the best place for them to be looking um yeah it's uh yago garay on all social media instagram youtube facebook whatever yago i-a-g-o and um yeah just uh love people to follow me there and send me a message if if you feel like it's it's always cool to connect with people nice and what about uh diet bro where, where are we looking to find that stuff yeah so you can go online on dietbro.com mm -hmm. 
and we ship worldwide and you can see all the cool things that we make and uh you can same diet bro on instagram and uh yeah please check it out because we make cool stuff awesome, man. you're gonna like it you do yeah awesome i'll stick links to all of that stuff in the show notes but yeah been a real pleasure chatting man and uh yeah look forward to seeing you back between the tapes at some enduro world cups this year thanks man yeah i'm excited for that nice one cheers yeah okay <laughs>